The Concordia Deception, Space Colony One, Book One, written and narrated by J. J. Green. Chapter Ten. It had been agreed that they would stash the weapons in a certain shed for farm equipment. Conscious of the fact that he was openly carrying a gun, after he'd informed a guardian that he hadn't been issued one, Ethan quickly headed in the direction of the tool shed. Evening had fallen, and the settlement seemed unusually quiet. Perhaps the emptiness of the streets would work in his favour. As he passed the corner of a building at the end of a block, a hand grabbed his elbow and pulled him out of sight of the road. Cherry was standing in the shadows. Something's going to happen at the shed. I just went there to hide my weapon with the others. The place is crawling with guardians. What are they doing? Just hanging around in the street, loitering. He gave a snort of derision. When did a guardian ever loiter? That's my point. I think that somehow they figured out what we plan to do. They're waiting for us to bring over our weapons and then relieve us of them. Quite a few of the farmers went there already. I think they're caught in the shed, not wanting to leave with the guardians there. I won't take mine over then. I'll find another place to hide it. Exactly what I was thinking. Wait, said Ethan. That's no good. We can't leave the others to get caught. How many guardians did you see? Five. But I can't swear there aren't more. It wasn't like I stuck around and surveyed the place. And how many gens in the shed do you think? Twenty of us have guns. I guess most of them are there by now. Twenty against five is pretty good odds. Twenty untrained gens against five highly trained guardians with superior weapons. Don't forget. I'm not forgetting. Their gazes met as they each made their decision. If we were fast, and if we approached from the east, simultaneously they nodded. Fifteen minutes later, after making a wide circle around the tool shed through several streets, they prepared to close the final distance. The guardians wouldn't be expecting anyone to approach the shed from the direction of the shuttle field. No gens took the regular shuttles to the Nova any more. If they rushed down the street, they could join the other farmers before the guardians knew what was happening. Alone, a gen didn't stand a chance against a guardian, but together they might be able to resist the attempt to take their weapons. At the very least, it would be a show of strength and an open demonstration that gens were not going to take their suppression lying down. Ethan and Cherry were at the end of the street. Cherry had been correct. Five guardians were spread about, doing bad impersonations of people hanging around with nothing to do. In their formal uniforms, the effect would have been almost comical if it weren't for the fact they were armed. The rest of the colonists had clearly received the message that something confrontational and dangerous was about to go down because this part of the settlement was entirely deserted. Okay, Ethan whispered. Let's go. Their weapons at the ready, they set off running down the street, stooping low and trying to make as little noise as possible. Their efforts paid off. They made it nearly a third of the way before a guardian noticed them. She called out for them to stop. Neither Ethan nor Cherry even broke pace. Ethan gripped his gun tighter and sped up. There was no sense in trying to avoid detection now. Hey! the guardian called more harshly. Stop right there! Now! The farmers in the shed must have realised what was happening. The door opened a crack and light from inside spilled out. Stop or I'll shoot! shouted the guardian. But Ethan was almost at the doorway, which was widening. A hiss and a burst of warmth came from behind him. Then he was through the door and inside the shed. He spun around. Where was Cherry? She was flying into the shed right behind him. With a slam, the door closed. He grabbed Cherry's upper arms. Are you okay? I thought you were hit. She shook her head, panting. A round hit the sidewalk between us. That was lucky, a man said. It was Misha. I don't think so, Cherry replied, still gasping. They were so close, they could have hit either of us if they'd wanted. I think they were only trying to scare us. 
That's something, said Misha. They aren't prepared to kill us just yet. Let's hope it doesn't get to that, said a woman named Fi. The door rattled in its frame. Someone was trying to open it, but it had been locked after Ethan and Cherry went in. A succession of loud, hard knocks sounded out. Open up, a guardian said. We're taking your weapons into safekeeping. If you just hand them over, no one will get hurt and there won't be any repercussions. We know exactly who you all are. If you don't comply, you'll be breaking colony laws, and you'll be subject to punishment. What's that, I wonder, said Misha. The punishment, I mean. They'll have to decide what law we're breaking first, Cherry said. I don't think there is one referring to weapons. They aren't mentioned in either the old or the revised manual. The door resounded with another loud knocking. Come out. You have one minute until we make you. Ethan went over to the door. You're the ones acting illegally here. Guardians have no jurisdiction in this colony. Even if we were breaking any laws, which we aren't, you fired on me and Cherry with no provocation. If you don't back off and leave us to go about our legal business, you'll be the ones in contravention of colony laws. We give you one minute to vacate this area. Ha, said Misha. That told them. But as he turned to face the farmers, Ethan's expression was grave. What I want to know is, how did they know what we're doing here? The implication of his words lay heavy. Gazes were shared around the room. Had someone informed the guardians about the plan to stash the weapons? There was no other explanation for them being here. One of the reasons they'd chosen the tool shed was because it wouldn't be unusual to see farmers come and go from it. It was very unlikely that a guardian had noticed their movements and guessed what they were doing. I can't believe anyone would do that, Cherry said quietly. Who would do that? Her eyes searched the faces of those around her. Someone on the lookout for themselves, said a woman. The farmers shifted uneasily waiting for the guardians to make a move. They stood and sat in the cramped space, surrounded by shelves filled with powered farming tools. The tools could double as weapons in a pinch. Ethan winced at the thought of the damage they would inflict on the human body. More than a minute had passed. The guardians seemed to have backed down on their threat. Should I look outside? Misha asked. No, Ethan replied. Wait a little longer. They might be expecting us to open the door out of curiosity. It would make forcing us out a lot easier. Another minute passed, then another. By the time half an hour had passed, the farmers were growing fidgety. Ethan felt the same. The waiting was unbearable. He almost yearned for the guardians to burst in. Abrupt knocks made the entire room of farmers jump. We demand that you open up on the authority of the leader. Well, that was quick, Cherry said to Ethan. You told them they didn't have any authority, so they went and got the authority. We do not recognise the legality of your demand, Ethan retorted. The colony has no leader. The newly elected leader is Anahi. On her authority, we demand that you leave. Shit, Ethan said. They've elected the Woken. Who's elected her? Cherry asked. We didn't vote. I bet they've changed the rules so that we can't vote, said Misha. They're just doing whatever they want to get their way. I don't know. Maybe we should give up and leave quietly. They said there won't be any repercussions. I don't believe that for a minute, Ethan said. They know exactly who we are. We've shown our hand. There's no turning back now. I'm for fighting them. He held up his weapon. Who's with me? Cherry followed suit and raised her gun. One by one, the rest did the same. All except Misha. Finally, he raised his weapon too. Ethan said, We won't open the door except as a last resort. We can fire through the shutters. My guess is that one or two guardians are directly behind the door. The rest are probably either next to it or across the street, ready to grab us if we run. Set your guns to stun. Stun? Cherry asked. Isn't that a bit stupid? 
I'm pretty sure they aren't planning to stun us. You said you thought they deliberately missed us when we ran in here. That was before they had the authority of the self-appointed leader. Now they can do what they like. We don't know that, and I'd rather avoid more loss of life. Too many people have died already. Her brow wrinkling in disapproval, Cherry turned the dial on her weapon. Right, Ethan said. You two on these shutters, you two on those. He motioned the farmers he'd pointed at to their positions. Cherry, you and me are aiming for the long-range targets. He took up a position facing the crack between one set of shutters. The pair of farmers he'd nominated stood on each side, ready to fire at an angle. Cherry went to the other side of the room and stood with her rifle at her shoulder, left foot forward. He gave a nod and the shutter slats opened. The gaps were just wide enough to fire through. Pulse slugs hissed from every weapon, and in the enclosed space the air was tinged with their faint acrid afterburn. From outside came the ugh of a pulse reaching its target. A flicker of movement passed on the opposite side of the street, and Ethan's finger jolted on his trigger. The figure was gone. He didn't know if he'd scored a hit. A massive blow hit the door. At the same time, a pulse round hit one of the shutters. Half of the round made it through and grazed Misha's face. He gasped and dropped his gun, his hand gripping the spot. Close the shutters, Ethan shouted. As they swung to, another massive blow hit the door, but it held. Then it began to smoke. Having failed to batter it in, the guardians were firing their weapons at it. The smoke quickly thickened. Move back, Ethan said. The minute you see any of them come through, start shooting. Some farmers spread themselves along the wall on each side of the door. Others found positions around the room where they were able to take aim. Ethan held his rifle grimly at his shoulder. He could hardly believe that only a few weeks ago, at the execution of the natural movement saboteur, Strongquist had patted his shoulder and called him a hero. Now he was in armed conflict with the people who had turned up to rescue them. The people the Jens had named Guardians because they believed they would protect them from the dangers of this new world. Now it looked like they needed defending from their Guardians. How had it come to this? The smoke from the door was filling the room. The melting material gave off a choking and unpleasant reek. Any minute their enemies would be through and the firing would begin. He wished he'd had a chance to talk to Cariad. She was awoken. If he didn't make it, he hoped she would sort out the colony's strife. Chapter 11 Cariad headed toward Anahi's quarters, determined to make the woman think twice about her actions. Visiting the Guardian ship had been an interesting distraction, but Anahi's not-so-subtle move to wrest power from the gens had grated on Cariad more and more in the intervening hours. She was damned if she was going to stand by while someone took the colony in a direction that made a mockery of everything it was supposed to stand for. Anahi lived in the agricultural area of the Nova, which spanned three kilometres of the outer rim. She was responsible for developing crops that would grow in the conditions of the new planet. Some of the fields that had sustained 2,000 gens during their long space voyage had already been converted. They now held the new planet soil in experimental beds, where Anahi could test the modified crops. In the years before arrival day, Cariad had enjoyed going to the fields. The massive lights mimicked nearly temperate climate levels of sunlight, and the growing plants gave the air a green smell. She had felt almost as though she were back on Earth. During those two years since they had both been revived, Anahi had seemed a cordial enough colleague. The emotional delicacy Cariad had noted before departure had been the same, but Anahi had never been unpleasant. How long had she been planning to move the colony to Woken Control? Cariad spotted Anahi working in a field. 
the older woman stood up from a crouch, shears in hand, holding a handful of plant stalks. Cariad changed direction and made her way down a muddy path toward her. Anahi's vision aids really did seem to give her eyes in the back of her head. She turned around when Cariad approached, even though she'd been facing away. Anahi's arms fell limp. I thought you would be along sooner or later. I wish it had been sooner, Cariad said, standing at the edge of the rice paddy. Can we talk? If you like, but you aren't going to change my mind. Anahi put the cut stalks in a trug and squatted down once more. Firstly, it's clear you have the backing of most of the Woken because no one spoke out against you. But you have absolutely no mandate for what you're doing. Anahi shrugged. The generational colonists had no mandate to revise the manual. That didn't stop them. I'm not doing anything different from they did, except that I know what I'm doing. Do you? When the gens changed some parts of the manual, they were only trying to exercise some control of their situation. They didn't choose this life. We consigned them to it. It shouldn't come as a surprise they want a say in their destiny. Anahi was examining the base of a plant. I don't disagree. And in fact, I don't blame them for what they did. As you say, it's a natural human reaction. However, they had no automatic right to do it. So when you come here and tell me we have no right to take control away from them, I can only point out the hypocrisy of your position. But we're the ones who wrote the manual. If anyone should abide by its rules, it's us. Do you want to demonstrate that it's acceptable to seize power and do whatever you like? That's a dangerous precedent to set. I didn't hear your protests when you found out about the revisions they'd made after you were revived. Anahi deposited another handful of stalks in her trug and leaned in to cut a third. You're not getting it. We can't change everything just because we think we know better. You're not getting it. Anahi stood and pointed her shears at Cariad. We can and should change things because we do know better. If you had a dog, would you let it run through traffic because it saw a rabbit? If you had a child, would you allow it to wear summer clothes when it was freezing outside? She walked up to Cariad, her basket hooked over her arm. Look at these rice plants. They're growing pretty well, don't you think? If none of us had survived cryo, do you think a gen could have modified them to grow in this soil? Of course not. Even the ones who specialised in genetics have next to no practical experience. It would have been years before they grasped the techniques required to do the work I do. If I wasn't around, they would have been forced to grow seed suited to earth soil, which would have given half the yield. Back home, it wouldn't matter. There's enough surplus food that no one starves from a few crop failures. Or there used to be, anyway. Here, low yields could mean the difference between survival and death. You're being ridiculous. You did survive, Cryo. And here you are, doing your work. No gen would have stopped you. The entire colony recognises the importance of what you do. You didn't have to seize control in order to modify crop genes, didn't I? Anahi seemed to glare behind her visor. There are 2,000 gens, and only a hundred of us, and another hundred still in cryo. All it would take would be one madman, Cariad, one cultist or schizophrenic. That would never happen. All the first generations and all the stored game eats genes were screened for mental illnesses. Or one power-hungry idiot, Anahi continued regardless, to persuade the rest of them to follow him. And who knows what could happen? They could decide to murder us all in our beds. There's no protection for us out here. Or at least there wasn't until I asked the Guardians for their support. Up until now, the generational colonists could have done whatever they liked. Done what they liked? You think they could murder you? Now I'm thinking you're the one who's insane. I'm not mad. 
Anahi said crisply, pushing past Cariad on the narrow path. I'm pragmatic. She set off toward the glass houses bordering the fields. Cariad followed on her heels. You're reacting to a situation that you think might happen. You're punishing the gens before they've done anything wrong. Helping someone isn't a punishment, and they need our help. No, they don't. And it's a punishment if it's unneeded and unasked for. Wait a minute. She grabbed Anahi's shoulder, forcing her to stop and turn around. Though her eyes were covered by her vision aid, the woman's anger was evident from her thin, set lips. Cariad asked, Are you sure that helping the gens is what this is all about? Yes, I am. Helping them and helping us. It's the only sensible thing to do in the circumstances. Are you aware they have already begun using fitters whenever they want? And some are leaving their designated professions, choosing to do whatever they fancy? We don't have that kind of wiggle room. Maybe in two or three generations we might, but not now. We can do this, but only if people stick to the plan. Bullshit, spat Cariad. No one is going so far off the guidelines to make a difference. I know what this is about. It's all about you, Anahi, isn't it? You want to be the one in control. You don't like the idea of Jens being in charge. It scares you. Or did the decades in cryo give you some kind of god complex? You're talking nonsense. Anahi marched toward the glass houses. Cariad watched her go, her guess about Anahi's motivations gnawing at her. Was she right? If she was, the scientist posed an even greater danger. As she decided to leave and consider her next move, she saw Anahi stop. She was answering a comm. The message seemed to agitate the scientist. She began to run, and as she went, her carefully gathered plant stalks spilled from her basket. Anahi didn't pay any attention. She reached a hut and went inside. Curious, Cariad jogged after her. When she peered in at the door, Anahi was at an interface, speaking to a guardian. The background showed he was at the settlement. Cariad ducked outside again. Anahi was facing away, but that didn't mean she couldn't see her. She leaned against the wall and listened. The gen farmers are refusing to give over their weapons, the guardian was saying. We have them confined in one place, an equipment storage building. They were going to stash the weapons there. They noticed our presence, unfortunately, and locked themselves inside. They're refusing to come out or surrender their arms. You have to get those guns off them. We can't allow them to have any firepower. The Guardians must be able to control any potential unrest. We know, but as one of them pointed out, we actually don't have any jurisdiction within the colony. By trying to force them to surrender their arms without the proper authority, we're breaking colony laws. Only the leader has the authority to order the use of force. Currently, there is no leader. This seemed to stump Anahi for a moment. Cariad heard no immediate reply. Then the Woken said, Well, that's simple then, isn't it? I declare myself leader. I authorise the Guardians to use all necessary force to seize the weapon of any gen. The Guardian hesitated. Anahi challenged, What's wrong? Do as I say. I'm not sure. Look, we revised the manual to allow a Woken to become leader, right? But we didn't define how the Woken leader would be chosen. Nowhere does it say the Woken leader has to be elected. Until that part is decided and ratified, anyone can declare themselves leader. That's exactly what I'm doing. When the Guardian still gave no reply, Anahi said, I'm ordering you to force entry to the place where the gens are confined and seize their weapons. Do you understand? After another moment's silence, the Guardian's reply came. Yes, leader. Cariad was frozen in shock. The Guardian asked, I'm assuming we set our weapons to stun. After a pause, Anahi replied, As I said, 
Use whatever force is necessary to seize the Jen's weapons. Cariad couldn't let this insanity continue any longer. She ran into the room. Anahi turned to face her. Behind the scientist, the interface screen was blank. The guardian she'd been speaking to had left to carry out her orders. Call him back! Someone's going to get hurt! Nonsense! The generational colonists will give themselves up. They're just testing their boundaries. You're insane! You really are! You ordered the Guardians to take the Gen's weapons? But they need them! They're facing deadly life forms down there! They have to be able to defend themselves! We cannot allow them to have weapons that could be used against us! Cariad stepped so close to Anahi, their noses were almost touching. She glared into the black light-sensitive screen of the woman's vision aid. Call the Guardian back! No! I warn you, this won't stop here. I won't rest until you're made to answer for your actions. If anyone's hurt down there, you'll pay for it. Anahi laughed. I think you overestimate the support you'll have. The Woken are on my side in this. They're just as tired of the Gen's stupidity as I am. Do what you like. You'll be fighting a lonely battle. Cariad had no time to argue with the unbalanced woman. She had to do something to stop the carnage threatening to occur at the settlement. She ran out of the hut and sprinted to the nearest transit car station. She would go planet side. As she was sitting in the transit car to the shuttle bay, wishing the vehicle would go faster, her comm chirped. It was Stromquist. Guessing that he wanted to talk to her about Frederick Apparicio, she pressed the busy button. Immediately the comm chirped again. She answered, I can't speak to you now. No point in appealing to him about the situation at the settlement. The guardians were clearly on Anahi's side. Are you going to board a shuttle? Stromquist asked. Wondering how he knew, she replied, Yes, I am. Why? I believe you may be aware of the developing standoff between guardians and gen farmers at the settlement. Yes, your people are about to cause a disaster. I was hoping you had received the news. It is regrettable. Unfortunately, our protocols state that we obey colony law, or, failing that, the orders of the colony leader. Unfortunately, you're a bunch of fools. You're following the orders of a madwoman. I think the cryos turned her crazy. She's megalomaniacal. So you're going down to the planet to intervene? Yes, I am. That's good. What? If you think it's a good idea to intervene, why don't you do it yourself? Why don't you call off your buddies? I'm afraid I can't. We have to follow protocol. Even if someone might get killed? Stromquist seemed to struggle for an answer. We respect the leader's judgment. Any threat to human life is acceptable, if it's for the greater good of the colony. The transit car was pulling into the shuttle bay station. So what you're telling me is, I'm on my own in this. As I said, we will follow the leader's orders. Thanks a lot. Cariad closed the connection and ran for the shuttle. It was just about to leave. When she went into the passenger cabin, it was empty. The shuttle was the last of the day travelling to pick up Woken who had been working planet side and bring them back to the ship. On her way down, she tried to figure out a way of removing Anahi from the leader's position. Persuading the other Woken was going to be a struggle. They were sympathetic to Anahi's cause. Ever since being revived, most of them had been distant from the Gens. Cariad realised she'd been remiss in doing nothing about the growing divide. She silently cursed Stromquist and the rest of the Guardians. She could hardly credit that they would allow themselves to be turned into the colony's bully boys. Anahi had availed herself of extremely dangerous, powerful allies, and Cariad didn't know what she could do about it. We must follow the leader's orders. If Anahi ordered them all to walk out of an airlock, would they do it? Her mind turned to the gen farmers who were refusing to give up their rifles. Was Ethan among them? Her stomach clenched at the thought. 
By the time the shuttle touched down, she was no closer to figuring out how she was going to defuse the crisis. She sped past the waiting line of scientists and out of the shuttle field. She had recognised the farmer's equipment shed behind the Guardian while he was talking to Anahi. It was on the edge of the settlement. The streets were quiet. Darkness had fallen and the solar-powered lamps had come on. A dull thump echoed in the distance from the direction where she was heading and sounded like something heavy striking a hollow place, like a battering ram striking a door. She sped up. She was only a couple of streets away. Another thud. How could she make the Guardian stop? We must follow the leader's orders. She couldn't come Nahi and demand that she call them off. The self-appointed leader would never agree. As she rounded a corner, Cariad almost stopped in her tracks. The self-appointed leader. Anahi had declared herself leader, saying there were no laws in place governing a woken leader's appointment. So unless Anahi had put laws in place in the intervening time, she was in the street that held the equipment shed. Guardians were grouped around the door. A haze was rising from the pulse fire they were aiming at it, attempting to burn the thing down. Hey! she yelled from the end of the street. A few of the guardians heard her. Stop what you're doing! I demand you leave those people alone! She ran up to the group. The guardians paused their pulse fire. One said, We are following the leader's orders. I know, but the leadership has changed. I'm now leader of this colony and I command you to withdraw. Chapter 12 Voices were coming from outside the door. New voices. Ethan thought he recognised one of them. I command you to stop, a woman was saying. Lower your weapons immediately. There was further discussion that Ethan couldn't quite hear, an argument that went on for some time. He heard the words leader and manual mentioned. Then after a long, quiet pause, there was murmuring, followed by the woman speaking again, this time through the door. Whoever's inside, this is Cariad. I've ordered the guardians to stand down. You're not in any danger. You're free to leave and no harm will come to you, I swear. Cariad. Open the shutters, Ethan said. The room began to clear of haze. After taking off his shirt and wrapping it around his hand, he opened the hot door. Cariad was directly outside, flanked by guardians. His first impulse was to grab her into his arms, but something made him stop. A sense of disloyalty to Lauren? No, it was something else. Ethan, Cariad said with relief, I thought you might be here. I'm so glad you're okay. Has anyone been injured? Yes, but nothing major. He stepped aside to allow the others to come out. The guardians also moved back to make room for the men and women. The farmers watched them suspiciously as they filed by. Their weapons clutched close to their bodies, dark and angry expressions clouding their features. The rift between gens and guardians and woken yawned wider. Cariad glanced at the guardians before saying to Ethan, Can we talk in private? And they went in the opposite direction to the departing farmers, also leaving the guardians behind. See you later, Cherry called. She didn't look too happy about leaving him with Cariad. As soon as they were out of earshot of both groups, Cariad laid a hand on his upper arm and said, I'm so sorry. I've been trying to talk some sense into Anahi. But she's gone crazy. I can't reason with her, and I don't know what to do about it. She also seems to have most of the Woken on her side. What did you do? How did you get the Guardians to back down? That's another crazy thing, Cariad replied, and went on to explain that she had temporarily declared herself leader. You mean the Guardians just did as you asked? Just because you said you were the new leader? That's exactly what happened. He glanced back at the guardians in the distance. So what would happen if I declared myself leader and told them to go and arrest Anahi? 
I don't think that would work. Since Anahi changed the manual, it has to be awoken. Then maybe you should tell them to arrest her. I thought about it, but I don't want to do that, and I'm not going to contest it when she takes back the leader's position, as she inevitably will. Too many of the Woken think like her. It wouldn't be long before I found myself arrested. Up until now, Anahi's been tolerating me. She was trying to bring me to see her point of view. I don't think even after this incident she would do anything rash against me. Most of us Woken go back a long way. But I definitely don't want to push it. I can only work to change the situation if I have my freedom. So what are you going to do? Her expression told him that his question stung. Perhaps he had been too harsh, but on the other hand, he didn't see how any of the problems were the fault of the gens. They'd all mostly been doing as they were supposed to. None of them had deviated much from the manual, despite, in his own case, a strong desire to. It was the Woken who were changing the rules. It was the Woken who had slipped up and allowed a natural movement saboteur aboard the ship. Cariad was awoken too. Maybe I should speak to the others privately and try to make them see sense. If I can change enough minds, we might be able to transition back to a more equitable situation peacefully. I know most of the Woken well. They aren't bad people. They're just worried about the long-term survival of the colony. They will be shocked to find out what happened here today. I hope it won't take much of an effort to persuade them that Anahi is unstable and needs to be stopped. He didn't have much faith in her plan. Her personal closeness to the Woken was blinding her to their faults. Yet he didn't have a better solution, or at least not one that didn't involve violence. OK, but I'll tell you this, Cariad. We may not be as well educated, experienced or sophisticated as you, Woken, but that doesn't mean we'll tolerate being controlled by you for very long. We were brought up with the manual. We know exactly what it says. And nowhere does it say that the Woken are to take charge of the colony. You're supposed to be here to join and support the colonisation effort. We aren't your slaves. The adrenaline of the fight was fading and his delayed emotional reaction was flooding in. His tone had risen. With some effort, he controlled his anger. We outnumber the Woken forty to one. And we're armed. Don't imagine we'll ever surrender. All our lives it's been drilled into us that this world is ours, that we're going to make it a home for our children and grandchildren. If it comes to consigning our descendants to what's basically slavery, what I mean is, you Woken might be able to turn the Guardians on us, but we won't go down without a fight, even to the death. He found himself leaning menacingly over Cariad. She had turned pale with shock. He stepped back. An apology rose to his lips, but didn't make it out of his mouth. Though it pained him to have spoken so bluntly and threateningly, he'd meant every word of what he'd said. It wouldn't hurt to impress the seriousness of the situation upon her, so she would convey it to her friends. She hung her head, uncharacteristically deflated. His conscience twinged. Perhaps he'd been too frank. She was, after all, his closest friend, despite being awoken. She had saved many gens from a horrible death in the first night attack, and she'd diffused the situation over the weapons. But then her head rose. She had a sharp look in her eye. Has it ever occurred to you to ask yourself why this has happened? What is it that's made Anahi take these steps to remove control from the gens? She wants the power, of course, like most of the Woken. When it came down to it, in spite of what it says in the manual, some of you can't stand to see us in control. Some of you can't bear it that your pet project you worked so hard on has been handed over to someone else. You're wrong. That isn't it at all. Or at least not for most of us. You're forgetting that I was there when the manual was written. Hell, I even wrote some parts of it myself. 
We knew that what we were demanding of you wasn't fair. The people who embarked on the voyage knew they would never set foot on a planet again. But the next generation didn't agree to that, and neither did the next. We knew we were demanding the sacrifice of thousands of people to see the project through to the end and make our dream come true. We decided that the minimum we could do in recognition of the nameless individuals who lived and died aboard a starship would be to gift the planet to you, the final generation. We had put you in the position you were in. You hadn't asked to be here. We wanted you to be in control. We wanted it to be your world, and we would only be there to help. So what changed? Can't you even guess, Ethan? When we were revived, we found that somewhere along the journey, the manual had been rewritten. People who had never seen Earth, never breathed a natural atmosphere, and who never would, thought they were in a position to dictate what would happen. We didn't like it, but we didn't say anything. We left you in control. Now think back to the first night attack. How did all the gens behave, with you as the only exception? It was near total panic. They couldn't deal with the emergency. And what's been happening since? You're doing as you like, changing roles, using equipment in ways it isn't supposed to be used, putting yourselves in danger. I don't agree with the way Anahi's gone about it, but I can't deny that she has a point. If we allow you to continue as you have been, acting stupidly with no thought of the future, this colony might fail. If we sit by and let you do what you want, we could all end up dead. All that work, all that sacrifice by tens of thousands of people will be for nothing. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Why can't you trust us? You made us after all. You, Cariad, are personally responsible for our genetic inheritance. What you're saying is, you've got it wrong. That's what you can't stand. You think you messed up. That's what's bothering you. That's why you want to take back control. The real problem is that we won't mindlessly obey. Do you want a second chance? Do you want to create people who will do as they're told? Your children have grown up and you don't like it. Her hands were clenched into fists at her sides, but she didn't offer a return argument. I'm going back to the ship. I'll speak to the others and see what I can do. He couldn't stand the hurt look on her face. He also couldn't take back what he'd said. When he didn't reply, she walked away. He watched her go. She glanced back and their gazes met. But still, he said nothing. After waiting for her to turn the corner, he went to see Garwin. The older man's job as a Priority One worker had qualified him for one of the first private homes to be constructed. He was a mechanic and chief supervisor overseeing the construction of ploughs, roadmakers and other machinery involved in creating the settlement's infrastructure. Most of the other gens were housed as Ethan was, in large temporary dorms and barns while they waited for more permanent homes. As soon as Garwin opened his door and saw who had come to pay him a visit, he glanced from side to side along the street, which was empty. He pulled Ethan quickly inside, his usually open, friendly features creased into an expression that mixed irritation with concern. Not a good idea coming to my house, Ethan, he said quietly the moment the door was closed and they were alone in the dim, quiet hall of his small home. Sorry, I didn't think about it. Did you hear what? Garwin's wife, Twyla, had stepped into the hall. She was a tall, raw-boned woman and her welcoming smile seemed fake. You're Ethan, right? I didn't know you were one of Garwin's friends. There's no need to stand and talk out here. Why don't you come in and have something to drink? She gestured for them to follow her and turned away. Garwin shrugged. Ethan guessed that his wife might not be privy to his subversive activities. He went through with him to the living room of the prefabricated house. The room's pale grey walls were brightened with cut-out prints of brightly coloured flowers. 
he was reminded of conversations he had had with Lauren about how they would decorate their farmhouse. Tea or coffee? Twyla asked. Tea would be fine. Garwin said, Sweetener? Ethan was about to say no, but an almost imperceptible nod from Garwin made him alter his response. Oh, uh, yes, please. Oh, we don't have any sweetener. We don't use it. The store's still open, said Garwin. Maybe you could go and get some. It'll be handy for guests. I guess so. Sit down, Ethan. You're our first visitor, you know. She went out into the hall. As he took a seat in the armchair of their matching living room set, Ethan began to speak, but Garwin held a finger to his lips. I know why you've come, but I'm sorry I'm no further along with that plough than I was yesterday. Like I said, the kit was incomplete, and I'm waiting for the missing part. It has to be printed and sent down. Until I receive it, there's nothing I can do. It isn't like I can just open another container and take it from there. Those things contain thousands of parts. The sound of the front door closing came through, and Garwin went out to check that Twyla really had left. When he returned, Ethan said, I didn't realise your wife doesn't know what else you do. Maybe I should go. It's OK. You're here now. We might as well make best use of the time till Twyla returns. You heard about the assault on the shed? Of course. That news is probably halfway back to Earth by now. We need to talk about that, but it'll have to wait for another day. We don't have time at the moment, but I just wanted to tell you, we learned something important today. The Guardians will do whatever the Woken tell them, and they're prepared to use lethal force. We nearly didn't make it out of that shed. We can't let them catch us out again. What I want to know is, what are we going to do to protect ourselves? I totally agree, Garwin replied. That's a question that needs answering immediately. We've been playing it too safe, with plenty of talk and precious little action. It's time to take control of the situation. We need to go on the offensive. The biggest problem we have is that nearly all of us are down here. The Woken are up there. He pointed upward. And as well as the force of the Guardians at their disposal, they have most of the tech. So what can we do about it? I'm not sure, but I had an idea. If the situation doesn't improve, as long as we stay here, we're at their mercy. They know exactly where we are and what most of us are doing most of the time. But we do have some things on our side. We've been trained in everything we need to build a civilization on this planet. It's been our one collective purpose in life since we were born, while the Woken are a bunch of scientists. Sure, they know more than us, but do they have the numbers or the raw power to make a colony of their own? They might not realize it, but they need us more than we need them. Ethan had an idea what Garwin meant, but it was almost too radical for him to comprehend. What are you saying? Look, we already have enough supplies down here to last us another year, plus tons of equipment. Most important of all, we have skills. Skills perfectly suited to the job ahead. But if we remain where we are, the Woken have us exactly where they want us. They're going to exploit us for their own ends. You're suggesting that we leave and build another settlement someplace else? Exactly. Chapter 13 As Cariad went to the meeting that Strongquist had called, her wish for easy solutions to the problems dogging the colony was peppered with pessimism. And Nahi's behaviour was unhinged, yet Cariad doubted she could convince the woman of it, nor any of the Woken who supported her. She had tried speaking to them as individuals, but she hadn't made much headway. Rather, she seemed to have turned some of them against her. And after the confrontation over the weapons, the Gens were also unlikely to be in a conciliatory mood. When she reached the meeting room aboard the Nova, Anahi had already arrived. She was the only person present, but she didn't acknowledge Cariad when she went in, preferring an icy disregard. 
Cariad sat down, and the strange silence continued until Strongquist stepped in, closely followed by Feynar. With an air of statesmanship, Anahi stood and welcomed the newcomers. She had reassumed the role of leader as soon as she'd learned of Cariad's trick. Then she'd immediately altered the legislation to prevent any further usurping of the position. The move had been inevitable, but Cariad was a long way from backing down. The two guardians sat together opposite Anahi, looking oddly twin-like side by side in their uniforms. Cariad had taken a seat at the end of the table. Strongquist had also invited Jens. She had high hopes over who one of them might be. It would make sense for the Guardian to invite prominent members of the Gen community, especially those who had been involved in the incident at the equipment shed. Garwin entered first. Cariad approved of Strongquist's choice. The man was sympathetic to the Woken concerns and well-liked among the Gens. They would listen to him. As the older, broad-shouldered man took a seat next to her, the person she'd been hoping to see also entered, Ethan. They exchanged small smiles. She was relieved their friendship seemed to remain intact, despite their recent falling out. Strongquist leaned his elbows on the table and clasped his hands together. Thank you for coming, everyone. I hope you'll agree it's long past time that some of us tried to take these problems the colony has been experiencing in hand. I'm hoping we can thrash out some steps towards solving them today. Wait a minute, Anahi said. Are these all the people you invited? I wasn't expecting so few. I suggested several names to you, but none of those people are here. Shouldn't we have a little more expertise on board? before we make any major decisions on the future of the settlement. And I'm not sure what she's doing here. The black strip of her visor turned to Cariad, her face stony. Leader, Strongquist began. Cariad balked at his use of the designation for the madwoman. I didn't intend that any decisions about the future of the Nova Fortuna colony be made at this time. Instead... I believe we should address the widening schism between the Gens and the Woken. We need to make an effort at conciliation and a meeting of minds. I propose that we address that concern first. We need to find a way to avoid further violence and move toward returning to the previous atmosphere of mutual goodwill. I'll suggest a way to avoid further violence, Ethan said bitterly. You guardians can stop your military tactics and the Woken can stop using you to control us. Let us gens go about our business freely. We haven't done anything that calls for our control by armed forces. And even if we had, so what? This colony is ours, as the manual says and the Woken used to say, until they changed their minds. Cariad raised her eyebrows. He was right but she was surprised to hear him speak so forcefully in front of Anahi and the Guardians. Ethan was growing in confidence day by day. Strongquist's expression was pained. He leaned back in his seat. What happened at the equipment storage unit was a situation that got way out of control. We should have found a better solution than an aggressive confrontation like that. Ethan asked, so we can have your guarantee that the Guardians will never threaten the Gens again? Strongquist looked at Feyner for a moment. Feyner answered Ethan's question. It's important that you understand our mandate is to support this colony at all costs. We must avoid the loss of life as far as we possibly can. But if, in the direst circumstances, we must use deadly force to ensure the colony's success... Our mandate allows us to do that. As she finished speaking, her pale brown eyes seemed to lose all warmth. What the hell are you saying? Cariad exclaimed. You're telling us the Guardians have the right to kill for the good of all? Who gave you that authority? No one here did. Not one person aboard the Nova Fortuna or Planetside has that right. She looked pointedly at Anahi. And who are the guardians to judge what's best for the colony and what isn't? 
You can't see the future. You can only guess, like the rest of us. Damned right! Ethan exclaimed, hitting the table with his fist. The first gen you kill will be the last. It'll be war. Into the tense silence that followed the outbursts, Strongquist said almost apologetically. I don't recall anyone objecting to the execution we carried out following the first night attack. Cariad and Ethan's gazes met. The Guardian's point was a good one. No one had challenged their actions when the Guardians killed the person who had turned off the electric fence, resulting in many horrible deaths. But at that moment, everyone had agreed who the enemy was. It was only now they might suddenly become the enemy that they objected to the Guardian's license to kill. This is all nonsense, said Garwin in a conciliatory tone. How can it be for the good of the colony to use lethal force? The first night attack was a special case, and if we ever catch the bomber who blew up the stadium, we'll make another exception. But for the general settlers, gens and woken alike, we need every one of them. There are only just over two thousand of us. I'm not a geneticist, but isn't that the bare minimum needed for the genetic diversity to colonize a planet? Aside from the moral objections to murdering people, we can't afford any more bloodshed. We need every single person. Anahi spoke. Actually, no, we don't. She paused for effect, a wry smile on her lips. Garwin and Ethan looked confused, but Cariad knew what she meant. We have enough eggs and sperm stored to replace every gen ten times over. It wouldn't be easy, of course. We'd have to reopen the reproductive labs, gestate the infants, and then care for excessive numbers of them at a time. But it's feasible. I think we could do it. You're insane, Cariad said. Whether we could do it or not is immaterial. You're talking about threatening the lives of thousands of people just because they won't do what you want. And what if this next generation you raise from babies also disobeys you? Do you plan on murdering them too, on and on, until our supplies run out and at last the colony fails? Stop downplaying the Gen's actions, Cariad. You need to stop making excuses for them. You know as well as I do the expertise and care that went into crafting the manual. If they pick and choose what they follow and what they ignore, it puts the colony and all our lives in jeopardy. If they won't do as they're told, they have to be stopped. And if I have to command the guardians to take whatever steps necessary to make them comply, I will do that. Aside from the insane logic of your thinking, you're forgetting the manual was written on another planet centuries ago. We were both there, remember? We both helped to write it. And at the time, we acknowledged that we couldn't anticipate every eventuality. That the manual was a guide only. And yet it's the best guide we have. If anyone's going to make a decision to deviate from it, it should be us. Cariad shook her head. You, you mean? There's something wrong with you, Anahi. Seriously. You aren't the person I worked with on the Nova Fortuna project. She turned to Strongquist and Feynar. I believe Anahi may have suffered brain damage while in cryonic suspension or during revival. She should be medically examined and treated if necessary. It's only manifested over the last few weeks, but she's becoming more and more irrational with each day that passes. How dare you! Anahi shouted, rising to her feet. She took a breath as if to launch into a verbal attack. Then she smiled and sat down. Why should I care what you think, Cariad? If I'm suffering from brain damage, how is it that most of the Woken agree with me? You must be about the only dissenter. Which makes me wonder why Strongquist even invited you to this meeting. Cariad performed a great service to this colony, and I believe that many Gens and some Woken respect her opinion. Despite your assertions, she is as influential as anyone sitting around this table. Anahi simmered, but she didn't reply. 
So what's the way forward? Garwin asked. We need to find a way to make things work between all parties. I'm sure none of us want the Guardians put in a position where they feel the need to exercise their mandate. Ethan said, The way forward is to return to how things were. We elect a gen leader and we get on with making our new home habitable. Without interference. No, said Anahi. The proposal of a gen leader is off the table. I won't countenance it and neither will the rest of the Woken. If you ever prove capable of following the rules we set out, maybe we'll think about it. But I doubt that's going to happen in the near future. Ethan's expression darkened. He was about to respond, but Garwin laid a hand on his arm. An unspoken message passed between them that Cariad couldn't interpret. I have a solution that I believe both sides might agree on. How about this? If, whenever a gen sees the necessity of deviating from the manual, they send up a request along with their reasons for it, then Anahi, as leader, can grant it or not. Ethan shot Garwin an indignant look. The older man gripped the younger's arm tighter. Ethan looked down and remained silent. Something ulterior was going on between the two men, but Cariad couldn't guess what it was. After a few moments' consideration, Anahi replied, I think I could live with that. A collective breath exhaled. The mood in the room lightened a notch, though not on Ethan's part. He remained gazing downward, a frown creasing his brow. The attendees began to shift in their seats. The meeting seemed to be drawing to a close, but Cariad still had questions. Strongquist, do you have any updates on your investigation into the stadium bomber? Only in the negative sense, I'm afraid. I inquired of all the Woken about the name you recognised from the list of natural movement followers, but no one else remembers him. We've also gone through all the backgrounds of every Woken, revived or not, and we haven't turned up a single lead. Ethan asked, are you saying the bomber was a gen? No, I'm not saying that, but now that we've thoroughly explored that avenue of inquiry, we are turning to the gens. Of the two groups, it's the least likely to harbour natural movement members. That's why we looked into the Woken first. But if the natural movement infiltrator died with the first generation, it's possible that the cult has been passed down somehow, from one generation to the next. Cariad said, there's one more thing I want to talk about. You told us today that the Guardians have a mandate to save the colony at all costs. That's the first I or anyone else heard about it, as far as I know. Let's be frank. We're almost entirely in the dark about you. You've told us hardly anything about who you are or what's happened on Earth since we left. Are you from the global government? I guess you're military, seeing as you're armed. But whose military are you? And how come you're so intent on making a success of the colony? Strongquist looked uncomfortable but nodded. He couldn't twist his way out of answering Cariad's questions, put directly and in front of others. All good points. Yes, we are from the global government. We were sent to save you when the natural movement's plan to sabotage the colony was discovered in the historical records, as you know. But we are also here to protect the colony because you represent humanity's hope. As Fainer said in the stadium, Earth, Mars and the outer moons are overpopulated. They are also polluted and low on resources. When we set off, longer than 18 years ago, the situation was dire. Now it's probably at crisis point. The solar system is not a place you would wish to return to. The one reason that the resources required to build our ship and send us here were allowed was in order to save you. You are humankind's hope. If the Nova Fortuna colonists succeed, there is a chance for the rest of humanity. Do you mean that if we make the colony viable, we can expect refugees from Earth? As far as we're aware, Faina replied, no refugee ships have departed Earth to come here. 
The global government is struggling to keep everyone fed, let alone anything else. It would find it hard to justify spending the billions needed to build a ship that would only save a few thousand people. Besides, overwhelming a fledgling colony with thousands more mouths to feed wouldn't be in anyone's best interests. Which isn't to say that, at some point in the future, you might not receive some arrivals hoping for a fresh start. But I don't think you need to worry too much about that right now. However, if the colony flourishes, it will prove that deep space colonization could be the long-term answer to the problems in the solar system. She placed her hands palm downward on the tabletop and leaned forward. We want you to succeed. Humanity needs you to succeed. We'll do whatever it takes to ensure that. Succeed at any cost? Cariad asked bitterly. If it means killing innocent people who just happen to have a different opinion? Is that a price worth paying? I didn't think that was what we were trying to build here. If their opinions are invalid and their actions harmful, Anahi said, we have every right to deny them with force if necessary. If someone gets hurt as a result, is that our fault? But anyway, we have the Guardian's word they won't harm anyone unless it's absolutely necessary for the sake of the colony. Now, it's time to move on from this circular argument. I have an announcement to make. Starting tomorrow, the process of reviving the remaining individuals in cryonic suspension will resume. We've looked at the problems that led to failures in the past, and we believe we've ironed them out. With more woken around, we'll have the benefit of additional expertise. Everything should go more smoothly. I'd appreciate it if you would lend a hand with the process, Cariad. I understand that you oversaw many of the more successful revivals after you'd recovered from your own. Cariad hesitated, surprised. The invitation was the last thing she'd expected from Anahi. She was sure the woman must hate her, following her recent interfering. Then she remembered the saying, Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Was this Anahi's way of keeping an eye on her? It didn't matter. The saying worked both ways, and several of her friends were still lying frozen in slush. If an attempt was going to be made to revive them, she wanted to be there. Sure, I'd be happy to help. I thought you would agree. I put someone rather important to the top of the list. The colony needs a clear sense of purpose and direction, and so tomorrow you can be in attendance at the reviving of Aubrio. Cariad's heart sank. Chapter 14 Ethan watched the curve of the planet's surface straighten out as the shuttle sank lower into the atmosphere. Below, the regular lines of the settlement were clear to see, carved on the natural landscape. After the heat of the meeting, his emotions were finally calming. The sight of the settlement and the planet they had yet to name provoked an unfamiliar feeling in him. The only sensation he could liken it to was how he used to feel when he was a little boy, returning to the kindergartner's dorm at the end of the day. His spirits would rise when he saw the room and his caregivers. Even the smell of the place made him feel warm and content. His feeling at that moment in the shuttle was similar, only stronger. He was looking forward to returning to the farmer's temporary housing, and maybe tomorrow he would go out to his farm, though he would stay well away from the lake. He'd planted seed with Cherry's help. Perhaps the shoots would be showing. Though the Nova had arrived only two months prior, he already felt a kind of bonding with the new planet, greater than anything he'd felt in all his years aboard ship. Garwin, who had been dozing in the seat beside him, stirred and woke up. He peered out the window. Nearly there. You know, I never thought much about the planet until now, Ethan said. I always focused on what we were supposed to be doing here. It was always, what do we have to do now, according to the manual? What do we have to do exactly right? That's how you and I were brought up, wasn't it? As far back as I can remember. 
From the moment I left my milk mother until arrival day, everything I did, everything I learned, was aimed at one purpose. Build a colony. Survive. That's how I saw things too. But look at it. Did you ever see such a wonderful sight? Garwin smiled. Never. Not in any vid of Earth. Not even in art. And you know what? It's ours. It belongs to us. Living here is what we were created for. We mustn't ever let anyone take it away from us. He was finally understanding what the feeling in his gut was. For the first time, he was seeing the planet as home. Not only that, he knew he would fight to his dying breath for his right to live on it however he wanted. The conflict with Anahi and her supporters wasn't about Woken versus Jens or minor points like whether flitters should be used for non-emergencies. It was about protecting his home, his territory and his independence. They didn't say much more as the shuttle made its final descent and landed. But as they were leaving the shuttle field, Garwin asked Ethan to follow him. It was soon apparent they were going to the flitter shed. A gen called Verney was guarding the vehicles. Ethan only knew him by sight. Verney's job was to check that the gens who borrowed the flitters had the authority to do so. The man took no notice when Garwin went in and beckoned Ethan to do the same. Inside, the space was full of the boxy, flat-bottomed vehicles, their covers down. Only one was missing from its bay, now that it was nearly evening. Are we going somewhere? Ethan asked. We're not. Not today. I wanted to bring you here so we can talk without being overheard. Garwin moved closer and held his gaze firmly. With most of the Woken remaining shipside, we have the planet virtually to ourselves. If we find a site for another settlement soon and transfer everything and everyone there little by little, well, we could do it under their noses. It's we gens who are in charge of most everything down here. We could manage it if we were careful. Then, once we've built our defences at the new place, the final few who are managing the facade of a working settlement can transfer over. When the next Woken or Guardian visits, they'll find a ghost town. I think it's a great idea, Ethan replied. He glanced around the shed. I'm guessing this is the reason you brought me here. You guessed right. I can't leave my job for long periods without it being noticed. But you have the perfect excuse to be away from the settlement. Everyone will assume you're working on your farm, and no one's likely to check on you. You're also a lot younger than me. I have to admit, I'm not up to spending hours travelling about these days. Verney here will let you take a flitter, no questions asked. I want you to look for a place, somewhere like this area, where the vegetation isn't too dense and the ground is flat, somewhere that seems safe. As soon as you've found it, we'll build a fence, set up a generator and start bringing supplies over. Before we know it, we'll have a new home. As the impact of what Garwin was suggesting settled in, Ethan didn't answer right away. Garwin mistook his silence for reluctance to agree. You'll be doing it for gen autonomy, don't forget. But if you want to think about it, I understand it's a lot to ask. It isn't a lot to ask at all. All my life I've wanted to be an explorer. You just gave me the perfect opportunity. I'll start out at first light tomorrow. When Ethan returned to the flitter shed the following morning, he was surprised to find someone besides Verney there. She seemed to be waiting for him. Hi, Cherry said. I hope you brought plenty to eat. I couldn't sneak much off the table at breakfast. I have plenty of food, but Garwin didn't mention anyone else coming along. He must have forgotten. I suggested that two people should go. You know, in case something bad happens, then the other one can go and get help. Makes sense, I guess. He scanned the identical flitters in their bays before pointing at the one nearest the door. We'll take that. Jump in. Wait, did you bring your weapon? We don't know what we might find out there. Of course. What did you think I was gonna do? Leave it at home and let the slug limpets get me? The what? 
the creatures that ate the people in the first night attack. Is that what we're calling them now? The memory of Lauren's corpse threatened from the edge of his mind. He suppressed the image, awoke and gave them some long scientific name that no one can remember. But we're calling them slug limpets. You know, like the animals in the vids at school. Half slug, half... I get it. You know they're a lot bigger than slugs and limpets. Don't imagine that if one attacked you, you're going to flick it off. Of course not. I wasn't there on the first night, thank the stars, but I heard all about it. She had climbed into the flitter. Are we going to set off now? He climbed in the other side, put his bag next to Cherry's on the back seat, and started the vehicle. As it rose thirty centimetres above ground and hovered, the interface screen came alive, displaying a map of the immediate surroundings. Satellites launched from the Nova mapped the terrain and weather systems for several hundred kilometres around, broadcasting the data to the surface. As long as they stayed with the flitter, they would know exactly where they were. The sun was just coming up and the streets were quiet. He drove the flitter the shortest route to the gate in the electric fence. It opened automatically and they were soon heading out across the fields. He took them in the direction of the lake, as if he were heading toward his farm. As soon as they were out of sight of the settlement, however, he veered sharply right. Cherry had been training her weapon on random items in the landscape, turning to keep them in sight as they passed by. At his change of direction, she lowered her gun and peered at the interface. Where are we going? Instead of replying, he took one hand off the steering disc and touched the interface image with his finger and thumb, pulling it smaller and increasing the scale. The flashing red dot that signified their vehicle slowed its pace rapidly on the larger map. Their direction was obvious. The ocean! Great idea! A grin spread across his face. We'll be the first humans to ever see it up close. But what if they have those thread monsters that lived in the lake there, only ten times bigger? Don't worry, we won't go too near the water. Only look at it from a safe distance. They'd been travelling for around two hours and the sun was well up when Cherry lowered the flitter cover. The wind was invigorating. They were passing through a wide valley meandering between high hills. Below them was what looked like an ancient dry riverbed filled with water-rounded boulders. Do you think, when the Woken and Guardians see that we've all left the settlement to strike out on our own, they'll come looking for us? I don't doubt it. And will they be able to find us? They'll find us for sure. We can't go far. We don't have the equipment all the time. If we did, maybe we could hide on the other side of the planet. Then it might be a long while before they found us. Hiding from them forever isn't the point, though. What we want to do is get out from their control. If they come after us and try to force us to return, we'll put up enough of a fight for them to conclude it isn't worth their while to make us come back. I hope it doesn't come to that. I don't think most of the Woken or the Guardians are bad people. They just don't trust us to not mess up. They won't do us much harm if we make it clear that all we want is to be left alone. They probably wouldn't go so far as to turn us into slaves or anything. At least, not according to Cariad. She said one of the aims of the Nova Fortuna project was to create a better society. Fighting each other isn't better. It's taking a step back. I can't believe they would really want that. But without us, what will they do? There aren't enough of them to create a settlement by themselves. At the meeting, Garwin and I went to on the ship, and Nahi said they could start up the generation cycles again, create new babies and bring them up. Maybe they'll do that, or return to Earth, though it sounds like conditions are bad there. If it's only the Woken who go, maybe the Guardians could fit them in their ship. I don't know. They can do what they like. It isn't our problem. He sniffed. Does the air smell strange? Cherry breathed in deeply through her nose. Yeah, it smells kind of, hmm, hard to describe. He checked the interface. 
The dot representing their flitter was at the blue edge of the ocean, but the scale of the map was large. He widened the image with his fingers and took another look. They were nearly at the ocean. Hills on their right were obscuring the view. Ahead, the valley petered out and ended in a narrow gap. We're almost there, he said, excitement rising in his chest. It's through that opening. He pushed the accelerator and pointed the flitter's nose at the patch of sky between the final hills of the valley. He peered ahead. Was it only sky that he could see? Or was that different blue at the bottom something else? The flitter cleared the last tens of metres and his eyes soaked up the ocean view spreading out before them. Less than a second later, the flitter's nose dipped and suddenly they were zooming vertically down. Cherry screamed as she fell forward. She hadn't fastened her safety belt. He grabbed her with one hand while desperately pulling at the steering disc with the other. He was hanging forward. Only his safety belt was preventing his certain death. Cherry's fumbling fingers quickly found and fastened her belt. He could concentrate on controlling the flitter. What's wrong? Pull it up! Rocks were zooming up at them. I'm trying. It won't move. It's sticking to the cliff. Oh, wait, I've got it. He pressed the screen. The flitter responded instantly. A handful of metres from the base of the cliff, its nose lifted until it was horizontal once more. That was close. No travelling without safety belts from now on. He checked the screen. The flitter's default setting was to remain 30 metres above the ground, and he hadn't changed it. The vehicle had done what its programme told it, maintaining a short distance between its base, only the nearest surface had been a cliff face. They were five metres above sea level. Blue waves were below and all around them. This, said Cherry, is amazing. Ever since he'd been a young child, he had wondered what it would be like to see an ocean. He'd also wondered how it would feel to set foot on the solid ground of a planet, but the concept of an ocean was something else. It was fairly easy to imagine standing in a landscape. The Nova had Main Park, and he'd anticipated that a landscape would be similar, only bigger. To an extent, he'd been right, but it had been almost impossible for him to grasp the concept of a vast sea of quadrillions of litres of water, not like the expanse of space, empty and barren, but somewhere entire ecosystems lived and died under the waves. Vids of oceans on Earth had seemed unreal, like cartoons. The most water he'd ever seen in one place was the contents of the vats that fed the showers. Water was a precious commodity aboard the Nova. The idea of enough of it to fill an ocean boggled his mind. He nodded slowly. The expanse had robbed him of words. He drove the flitter higher, well out of the reach of ocean thread monsters, and brought it around to see the place where they'd exited the hills. The gap they'd come through was clear. Judging from the worn boulders lying on the beach, their death-defying plunge had been along the route of what had once been a waterfall. The dried-up waterfall wasn't the only geographical feature to capture his attention. All along the cliffs each side of it were dark holes, caves. Chapter 15 For a place where Cariad had spent 184 years of her life, the cryo-chamber didn't look much like home. In fact, it reminded her of a morgue, and she was glad she hadn't asked to see it before she'd been frozen in suspension all that time ago on Earth. The coffin-sized receptacles holding the bodies slotted into the wall behind steel doors, and their minus 101 Celsius temperature chilled the room, frosting her exhalations. Beside each door was a panel that displayed the temperature, the occupant's name and number, and his or her physical condition. Sensors constantly scanned for evidence of decay. In the event that the temperature rose or the sensors detected a deterioration in the subject's condition, the individual was supposed to be revived immediately. 
The cryo units had functioned perfectly up until now, though that hadn't prevented problems from occurring during the revival process. Anahi had come along to the cryo chamber, as well as Dr. Montford, the woken physician who had treated Cariad after the stadium bombing, and Alastair, the medic who had also attended her. Montford was a cryonic revival specialist who had joined the project just before departure. None of the physicians who had put the subjects into suspension had applied to be one of those preserved, only serving to highlight the riskiness of the procedure. Dr. Montford had been one of the first to be revived by the Gens, and the only person in that initial batch to survive unscathed. Alastair was preparing the equipment on the cart that would transport Aubrio to a revival room. As Cariad watched the medic, she wondered which of the open doors and empty holes of vacated cryo units had been hers. It would have been easy to read the panels and find out, but she didn't want to know from which of those hollow graves she had arisen. Everything seems perfect, Montford said, straightening up from his squatting position next to Aubrio's chamber. He turned to Alastair. The cart's ready? Yes, I've double-checked all the equipment. It's at the correct temperature. Then let's begin. Montfort's tone had the air of someone enjoying a long-anticipated treat. He seemed about to rub his hands together in glee. The doctor squatted down again and inserted a card into a slot before swiping the display screen and pressing the keys that appeared. There was a click. The seal was broken. The door slowly, smoothly swung open. Montford keyed in another instruction, and the cryo unit slid out to its fullest extent. It was a transparent box, its sides and base threaded with fine wires. A translucent white gel filled the box, and suspended within it was a human body. Aubrio. He was pale, entirely hairless, corpse-like. Cariad's stomach twisted. She had passed many decades in the same state, a hair's breadth from death. Excuse me, Alastair said, as he wheeled the cart over to the opened unit. She stepped out of his way, and he positioned the cart parallel to the box. Two slim arms lowered and slid under it. The arms lifted and retracted, so the box moved over and onto the cart. The cart's monitoring equipment sprang to life, drawing data from contacts. Looking good, said Montford as he checked the readings. Let's go. Alastair activated the cart's electric motor and guided it toward the chamber exit. Cariad followed in its wake with the others. Feeling like she was in a funeral procession, she grasped for a distraction. She asked Montford, how have you altered the revival process to reduce the rate of complications? I thought you might ask me that. I haven't done anything very sophisticated. I've slowed the process down and increased the monitoring. I analysed all the data we had on the completed revivals. We were too ambitious in our estimation of how long it would take for organs and nerves to resume normal functioning. The problem was... The information on successful revivals that took place prior to the project was sparse. Not enough data to base our predictions on, Montford continued. I've set the revival equipment to automatically halt the moment the monitors pick up an abnormal reading. We'll wait a while before resuming the process. If the readings continue to register as abnormal, I may make the decision to lower the patient's temperature and resume suspension before any further damage is done. That sounds sensible, Montford asked. Did you do something similar with the few you oversaw? Before she could answer, Anahi interrupted. So if something goes wrong, you're saying we won't revive Aubrio? That's correct. Better to remain in suspension with the chance of a revival later than risk permanent impairment or death, don't you think? I'm not sure I agree. I've adjusted to my sightlessness, and we have the materials and skills to fashion other disability aids. I'd rather be here and blind than still in suspension. However, I bow to your superior judgment. 
For now, Anahi was clearly determined to have Aubrio up and around at almost any cost. It wasn't hard for Cariad to guess why. Anahi wasn't a natural leader, but Aubrio was. She was clearly hoping to align him to her cause and profit from the man's dictatorial skills. The procession proceeded to the revival room. The equipment it contained was highly specialised. From the warming unit that would gradually increase the temperature of the suspension gel by points of a degree at a time, all the devices were geared to the sole purpose of returning a long-frozen human body to normal health. Entering the room brought back strong memories of her own awakening, which she had relived after the bombing. The place was decorated in pastel shades, intended to be easy on eyes that hadn't worked for nearly two centuries. She recalled the pale yellows and blues as the first thing she'd registered, as she'd slowly come to, when her new life had begun. Alastair and Montford placed Aubrio's cryo unit inside a white plasti-steel container for the first stage of the process. Attach him, Montford said to Alastair. I'll be back in a moment. As he passed Cariad and Anahi, who were watching from the door, he said, There's no need for you to hang around. You know that nothing interesting is going to happen for a few days. He added to Anahi, I'll keep you informed of progress, leader. He walked away down the corridor, and without a word to Cariad, Anahi also left. Alastair was busily connecting wires and flipping switches. Cariad asked, How many revivals have you assisted with, Alastair? I was involved with most of them. He glanced at her with a smile. In case you're wondering, yes, I helped with yours. Don't you remember? He inserted a final jack and stood back before taking a slow walk around the revival container and double-checking the readout screen. She recalled her glimpse of Aubrio's prone figure in frozen slush. He'd been lying on his side in the recovery position. What's it like for you, watching us return to life? Weird at first, but you get used to it. Alastair folded his arms and frowned for a moment before saying, Your revival was straightforward. Textbook, in fact. But you were young compared to the rest. Others weren't so lucky. We did what we could, but sometimes their hearts just refused to start. Or just when we thought they were fine, their hearts would stop and nothing we did would get them going. Or everything would seem normal, but their reflexes were dead. Then... When they regained consciousness, they couldn't move their arms or legs. Or everything worked physically, but their brains were mush. Sorry, I didn't mean to sound so callous. I know, and it's okay. We all knew the risks. Thanks for bringing me back. No problem. So what does Dr. Montford's new process entail exactly? Nothing much for 72 hours. We'll begin internal warming afterward. Through the circulatory system, bladder, stomach, intestines and lungs. Lungs? Sure, it's another of the doctor's innovations. We spend the first nine months of life with our lungs filled with amniotic fluid and the patients don't begin breathing until right at the end of the process. How long will it be before you know the revival is successful? Montford said ten days before we replace the suspension fluid with blood. I think it's at least another five days after that before we attempt to start the heart. I'd say three weeks minimum, but you're better off talking to the doctor. Three weeks? A lot could happen in three weeks. She turned to leave. Did you know this man, Aubrio, back on Earth? Alastair asked. She'd almost forgotten he was a gen. So very few of them remained aboard the Nova, she'd grown used to thinking of everyone she encountered as Woken. Yeah, I knew him. I'm surprised you don't too. Didn't you cover the founding of the Nova Fortuna project in history at school? I did. I wasn't that interested, though. It's hard to care about a place so far away and events that took place so long ago. So Aubrio was a founder? He was the primary financier. 
When Alastair's expression still failed to register understanding, she added, The owner of Mercantor Enterprises. Oh! Recognition dawned on Alastair's face. He looked down at the frozen figure and took a step back, as if he was frightened of disturbing him. I had no idea he came along. It was his primary condition before contributing to the funding. He liquidated all his assets and sunk every last cred into the project. Even so, he barely scraped the 51% holding required to have the final say in board decisions. Aubrio was first on the list for cryonic suspension. It looks like he was forgotten in the race to revive the key scientists. You mean he gave up everything? The ability to have whatever he wanted? and taking a chance of never waking up, just to be part of the colonisation? That's the short version. The long story is he took his majority holding and used it to ensure he did everything in his power to make sure he survived and the colony was a success. I know Aubrio personally, because the minute the preparations began, he insisted on knowing about everything that was happening, in detail. He questioned everything too, even stuff he had absolutely no understanding of. Made all the scientists and engineers dumb it down until he thought he knew what it meant. Then he would challenge our decisions and suggest different ways of doing things, insisting we try them out, claiming to know better. Made our lives hell, basically, with constant interference as if preparing for humanity's first deep space colonisation project wasn't hard enough. She drew breath. The sight of Aubrio was causing long-forgotten memories to resurface. His constant obsessive observation and criticism had driven her crazy. More than once she'd been tempted to slap his smug face when he doubted her assertions, which were based on groundbreaking, world-renowned research she had personally conducted. Alastair said, smiling, I'm guessing you want to know when he wakes up, so you can be as far away as possible. Hmm, something like that. No, not really. You know the problems we've been having? I think Anahi plans on gaining Aubrio's support to tighten her grip on the colony. Reviving Aubrio is like trying to put out a fire with gasoline. Alastair frowned. He probably didn't know what gas was. A very bad idea. Gotcha. So I'm going to do the opposite of what I want to do. I'm going to stick to Aubrio like glue, hoping for some damage control. Do you want me to tell you as soon as he's awake? Can you do that? You aren't worried about getting into trouble with Anahi? He shrugged. We could pretend you happened along at the right time. Anyway, I don't care if she guesses what I did. I hate that crazy bitch. I really appreciate it. I want to warn you, though. The second he's awake, stay the hell out of his way. Aubrio is going to be so pissed he wasn't the first to be revived. Chapter 16 Ethan could hardly believe his luck in finding what seemed to be the perfect place for a new gen-controlled settlement on his very first scouting trip. He'd considered exploring farther before telling Garwin of he and Cherry's find, but Cherry had been as excited as him and had wanted to show Garwin the place right away. As they sped along in the flitter, returning to the site, Garwin was with Ethan in the front of the vehicle. Cherry was watching for dangerous life forms from the back, her rifle at the ready. Shelf clouds were building darkly and threatening rain, but Ethan estimated they had two or three dry hours ahead. I have to say, Garwin remarked, it feels good to get away for a while. I don't seem to step far from the workshop or home these days. How is work going? Ethan asked. Are there many more machines to assemble? Hundreds, and I also have to deliver and sometimes install them and instruct on their operation. Then people are always forgetting how something works or breaking it. I'm always busy. I don't see my work letting up for years to come. I'll have to start training some youngsters soon too. 
Otherwise, no one will know how to fix anything when us older mechanics retire. Will Twyla get suspicious while you're out here now? Ethan asked, remembering that Garwin's wife wasn't yet aware of the subversive movement he headed. They would have to tell all the gens what they were doing soon, but after the fight at the farmer's equipment shed, Ethan didn't think they would face many objections to their plan. No, it's fine, Garwin replied. She's used to me disappearing for hours. Those are the hills I was telling you about, Ethan said as they appeared on the horizon. After passing a few more kilometres in silence, Garwin said, I'm going to reserve final judgment until I've seen these caves, but I want to say I'm not entirely convinced by the idea of building the settlement there. I agree that caves would be terrific hiding places. I don't think the satellites or the mistral scanners will pick us up once we're inside, but what seems a sanctuary could easily turn into a trap. We might be able to prevent an attacking force from getting in, but they could also prevent us from getting out. All they have to do is lay siege to the place, and eventually they'll starve us into submission. I thought of that, Ethan said, but these caves are full of passages. We can probably find plenty of exit routes to escape from if we're under attack. Garwin nodded. OK, let's see. Fasten your safety belts. We're nearly at the old waterfall. Ethan had disengaged the default setting on the flitter. This time, when they zoomed out over the ocean, the vehicle didn't drop precipitously downward. Glancing at Garwin's profile, Ethan saw a grin growing wider over the older man's face as he surveyed the ocean. The rising clouds had only marginally dimmed its deep blue. Whatever we find at these caves, Ethan, I'm glad you brought me here today. Spitting rain began to hit. They would have to get undercover soon to avoid the approaching downpour. Ethan's gaze roved the cliff face before locating an opening large enough for the flitter. He flew the vehicle over and settled it down on the floor, which was thick with soft dust. When he stepped out, his boot sank a couple of centimetres into the dry material. Reaching into the flitter, he picked up his weapon. After his encounters during the first night attack and Cherry's experience by the lake, he wasn't taking any chances. The cave went back ten metres or so before the interior was lost in darkness. Not bad, Garwin said, looking around. Not bad at all, and I could make out plenty more entrances in the cliff. If the place is safe and has other exits, maybe this would make the ideal setting for our new settlement. He took out a bag containing helmets with lights. After you told me about what you found, I made these. If we decide to move here, we can fix up a permanent lighting system. But for now, these will come in handy. He turned on the lights before handing a helmet each to Ethan and Cherry. Ethan put his on and went deeper into the cave, his boots sinking in and leaving deeply ridged footprints at every step, the first human footprints ever in that place. The light beaming from his helmet bobbed in time with his steps, illuminating more of the back of the cave. The walls were smooth, as if water had once flowed through it. The other caves he and Cherry had examined had looked the same. He imagined the cliff face filled with pouring spouts of water. Let's see how far back it goes, Ethan said, as Cherry and Garwin came up behind him. But no splitting up, Cherry replied, and if we're in danger of getting lost, we come out immediately, OK? No one else knows we're here, and I don't want to die just yet. The farther they went in, the narrower the cave grew. They didn't appear to be in any danger of getting lost. It was one long tunnel. Gradually, the floor rose. The roof remained the same height, however, so they were soon stooping. A black gap in the wall opened on Ethan's right. I'm going to take a look in here. If it goes somewhere, I'll call out. The gap was tall, but only wide enough to squeeze through by turning sideways. Ethan eased in, the reflection from his helmet light briefly shining on the smoothly polished rock. He was temporarily blinded. 
The narrow space soon opened wide, but he stopped when he was through, waiting for the green glare affecting his eyes to fade. As he blinked, his view of the space became clearer. He was in a bowl-shaped chamber. The floor sloped down to the centre, and at the far side a hole opened in the ceiling. At one time water might have entered the chamber from above and pooled temporarily before running out and down the tunnel to the ocean. There was no other exit. He spent a few more moments assessing the chamber. It was entirely dry, and so deep within the cliffs the cool temperature should remain steady. He couldn't see any signs of animals or their droppings. The area would make a perfect storage place. He left to give Garwin and Cherry his assessment, turning sideways once more and edging through the gap. As he emerged into the main tunnel, the first thing he noticed was the lights from his companion's lamps moving oddly. Then he saw the reason for the odd effect. They were locked in a close embrace. Garwin and Cherry were kissing with an intensity that indicated a passionate, intimate relationship. His face grew hot with embarrassment. He took a step backward into the gap and paused, resting against the wall while he decided what to do. He scraped his helmet against the rocky surface, making plenty of noise. When he returned to the main tunnel, Garwin and Cherry were standing apart, looking like they'd hardly moved the entire time he'd been gone. It doesn't lead anywhere, Ethan said, and explained what he'd seen. Maybe we could use it for storing food. Great, said Garwin. This side is looking better and better. Let's see if we can find another exit, and maybe we'll have time to explore a few more caves before we leave. Cherry said, maybe some of them link up. More gaps appeared in the walls and ceiling as they went on, but not like the first. All were shallow, dead ends. They exited and flew to another cave. After exploring two more, the sun was getting low in the sky, and they decided to call it a day. Garwin and Cherry sat in the back while Ethan flew the flitter through the looming twilight. The rain had stopped, and the surrounding hills grew colourless and dark as the sun disappeared. The only sound was the wind. It was fresh and humid after the rain. Ethan didn't turn around while he drove, leaving Garwin and Cherry to their privacy. The sight of them kissing had awakened mixed emotions in him. First had come the shock. He had heard the rumours about Garwin, but it was another thing to be confronted with the evidence. Next came the ache and grief of his memories of Lauren. Finally, he felt something he realised he'd been denying to himself. As well as Lauren, the image of his friend's embrace had brought Cariad to his mind. He missed her and regretted their recent disagreement and unhappy parting. Chapter 17 Cariad surveyed the offerings at the buffet for tonight's dinner. Balls of yeast, flavoured and coloured to look like meatballs, floated in tomato sauce. Rolls of steamed rice wrapped in layers of dried seaweed. Algae strips nestled among assorted fungi. Deep-fried crickets rested on a bed of taro mash. She helped herself to some meatballs and salad and carried her tray to a table. The remaining refectory in use aboard the Nova was much quieter now than it had been before most of the gens had gone planetside. Though at the time she hadn't much liked the noise and bustle they created, she found that, now they were gone, she missed the crowds. Their absence had also made the seating arrangements more noticeable and fraught. Only a hundred or so woken ate in a room designed to hold five times their number, and who sat with whom and who sat alone was extremely obvious. She had adopted a default position, assuming that her vocal opposition to Anahi meant that no one would want to be seen with her. She always sat at an empty table. Occasionally, an old acquaintance would take the political risk of joining her, but often no one did. She didn't really mind or blame anyone, but sometimes she felt the absence of company. 
Opening her personal interface, she propped it up before digging her fork into the meatballs. She re-examined the links Stromquist had sent regarding the investigation into the bombing. Frederick Aparicio stood out in her mind, but it stubbornly refused to yield any more information about him. The more she thought about it, the more she was convinced that he had to be significant. He'd been on the covert list of Natural Movement members, yet though she'd had nothing to do with the organisation, she knew his name and recognised him. The answer was buried somewhere deep in her memory, if only her mind would let it through. Long experience of fathoming out scientific problems had taught her the best thing to do was to avoid thinking about the thing bothering her. She should put Aparicio out of her mind altogether. Then the link would probably pop out soon enough. But naturally, the more she tried not to think about him, the more he sprang unbidden into her thoughts. She chewed thoughtfully on a mouthful of algae and fungi salad, gazing at the frozen image of the man's face, staring up at the camera in the lobby of the building where he'd worked. He'd been a systems engineer, an odd profession for a natural movement member. The Guardian had said a fair proportion of them had occupied technical professions. Supposedly anti-science, they'd possessed that all-too-human hypocrisy about their beliefs. Frederick, she murmured, how did I know you? Are you working? She looked up to see René, a young soil biologist who had been her roommate when they were both recovering from revival. Not on anything productive, she replied, closing her interface. I won't disturb you if you're busy. It's fine. Please, sit down. René put down her tray next to Cariad's. Thanks, Cariad said. For what? Sitting with me. I'm not exactly popular at the moment. You mean for standing up against our new self-appointed leader? You're more popular than you think. More than a few of us feel the same as you. We're worried about the direction all this is heading, but we aren't sure what to do about it. She put down her fork. You aren't sure what to do? It's easy. Stand up to her. I only said some of us. Anahi has plenty of followers who think she hasn't done anything wrong. And you know what scientists are like. We hate getting involved in things that might take us away from our work. But don't think you're alone, because you aren't. René picked up a fried cricket with her fingers and bit it in half before crunching up her mouthful. Some of us want to swing things back to a more equitable situation with the gens too, but we don't know how. If you really want to do something, you can start by speaking out. Let Anahi know she doesn't have a unanimous backing for whatever she wants to do. That might make her think twice before introducing yet another rule to crush Gen autonomy. Or it might not. I don't know. I think she may be mentally unstable. And nothing anyone says or does will deter her. But it's worth trying. You're right. We should do that. And when you hear anyone praising what she's doing, challenge them. Remind them why we're all here. What our intentions were for the colony. They seem to have been forgotten, but you remember, don't you? You remember the kind of world we wanted to build? We wanted to leave behind corruption and selfishness and start afresh with better ideals. If the colony were made up of people brought up without the influences of human societies, it wouldn't be unequal or cruel or uncaring. That was the idea. I guess we thought wrong. Did we? Maybe if we hadn't come along too, the Gens would have achieved that. Maybe it's our presence that's creating the problem. But we shouldn't give up on that ideal. Things were going okay until Anahi decided to seize power. We can put things right again, if we're given the chance. I'm sure of it. You think all these problems are due to our being here? I guess that old saying is true. Wherever you go, there you are. We've brought the contagion with us. Even the natural movement came along for the ride, as if we didn't have enough to contend with. But that has something to do with what's happened. 
People are frightened, and when they're frightened, they see enemies everywhere, even in people who are really their friends. Maybe if we catch the natural movement saboteurs, the Woken and Gens would put aside their differences and reconcile. Maybe. Renee ate the other half of her cricket. I could never learn to enjoy those things. Too many legs. I like them. Full of protein, too. She popped another small one into her mouth. What I wouldn't give for a cheese sandwich, Cariad said, looking at her meal. She pushed her tray away. On rye with mayo. Are we going to have one of those foods I miss conversations? They only make the cravings worse, you know. Unless you hid some cow eggs and sperm aboard the ship, I don't think you'll be eating cheese again any time soon. No, Cariad replied wistfully. No cow eggs or sperm, or pigs, dogs, cats, chickens or ducks. No salmons, trouts, tunas or oysters. The decision to not introduce any earth animals to the new world had been beyond debate. Any escapees into the alien environment could be disastrous, putting the ecological systems entirely out of balance. Growing earth crops was risky enough. As for insects bred aboard the Nova, they were only available to eat on the ship. None would ever be taken down to the surface. On the new world, all food would be plant-based. The mention of animal gay meats tickled a memory at the back of Cariad's mind, but the sensation was so slight she barely noticed it. The thing I hate about it all, said René, is going down to take soil samples. I feel so uncomfortable working among the gens. I feel like I should wear a sign that says, I'm on your side. I try to tell them that, but I don't think they believe me. She ran a fork around her plate, scooping up the last of her taro mash as she went on. One of my last thoughts before they put me under for suspension was that I was looking forward to meeting the people who would be here when I was revived. I thought it would be cool to meet people who had grown up on a starship. She ate her fork full of food and asked, Did you guess that the colouring and build of the gens would homogenise like they did? To be honest, I didn't even consider it. We selected for health, mostly, absence of recessive gene conditions and sociability. Intelligence and other factors were a crapshoot. We predicted that we needed a range for a successful society. She frowned. The topic of the conversation was ringing a bell in her mind. What's wrong? I feel like there's something important I've forgotten. Something to do with the gene selection process. Does it matter any more? René asked. That was a hell of a long time ago. If you forgot something, there's no going back now. No, it isn't that. It's... What were you saying? I was talking about how the gens all ended up black-haired and olive-skinned. I was wondering if you or the other geneticists knew that would happen. And I said... Cariad gasped. That's how I know Frederick Aparicio. Excuse me? Frederick Aparicio. That's why I recognised him. Sorry, René, I have to go. She got up. Thanks for the talk. Remember to tell the others what I said. Stand up to Anahi. Show her she's going to be held accountable. See you soon. She hurried out of the refectory. She needed to speak to Stromquist. As she sped down the corridor to her quarters, where she would be able to calm him in private, the memory of Frederick Aparicio sitting in her office on earth played as clearly as if it had happened yesterday. As soon as she reached her cabin, she opened a comm to the Guardian ship. She had to wait to speak to Stromquist, and as she was waiting, she puzzled over something. The Guardians had all the documentation relating to the Nova Fortuna project, from start to finish. So why hadn't Stromquist come across Aparicio in a simple search of the records? Chapter 18 Cariad's face was vivid in Ethan's mind. He was glad he'd invited her to spend a day planetside with him, but he was also conflicted. The building of the new settlement at the Oceanside Caves was progressing rapidly, and the secret would weigh heavily on him while he was with her. 
He wasn't comfortable about hiding what the gens were doing from someone he'd grown close to. The problem was, the secret wasn't his to tell. It was something involving all gens. He couldn't betray them by telling Awoken about it, even though he personally trusted her to not do anything. Yet it was inevitable that Cariad would find out. There would come a time in the not-too-distant future when all the Woken and Guardians would discover the old settlement was nearly empty and most of the supplies gone. What would she think then? She would know he had deliberately withheld the truth from her. Would she understand? Or would she be hurt that he hadn't trusted her? He didn't know. All he could do was hope that one day he would get the chance to explain and that eventually she would forgive him. The only alternative was to avoid seeing her for weeks. He couldn't bring himself to do that. She was the one person who really meant something to him since Lauren and Dr Crowley had died. The shuttle wouldn't arrive for another hour, but he had nothing else to do, so he went to the flitter shed to borrow a vehicle. He planned on taking Cariad out to his farm to show her the green shoots sprouting in his fields and the small progress he'd made on the prefabricated farmhouse. In truth, Cherry had done most of the field work. She had turned out to be extremely adept and efficient at using the machinery. Perhaps that was one secret he wouldn't need to keep. The flitter shed was nearly empty. Most of the vehicles were being used to ferry equipment and supplies to the caves. With Verney in charge, he could turn a blind eye to the practice. Ethan took one of the few remaining vehicles and flew it to the shuttle field. An office had recently been constructed there to process shipments and passenger arrivals and departures. A step in the settlement plan too prominent to avoid, the Gens had built the office, but it was to be their final construction at the settlement. He parked the flitter in the lot and leaned back in his seat, putting his hands behind his head. Settling in for the wait, he enjoyed the pleasant anticipation of an afternoon with his friend. He looked up in the direction of the shuttle's approach. The sky was unusually empty of clouds. In a while, he would see a glint of light, the first sign of the descending aircraft as the sun reflected from its metal skin. Cariad would have already boarded. He imagined her in her seat, looking out of the window or reading her interface, her expression serious and intent. He liked how she always thought deeply about things, but he also loved it when she laughed. The interior of the flitter was warming up in the sunshine, making him sleepy. Soon he was in a light doze, and memories mixed with dreams played through his mind. He was young again, kindergarten age, and he was at Main Park with his class and teacher. All his classmates were playing or running through the grass and trees. Main Park was one of his favourite places. He loved the bright lights here, which his teacher had told him helped the trees to grow, and the smell of the air. It was cleaner and fresher than anywhere else. He was also fascinated by the clock. Every time his class came here, he would look up at it to read the numbers. Each time they were different. The numbers at the end of the line changed as he watched, and they counted down, which was strange. All the other clocks he'd seen counted up. His teacher had told the class that the clock was counting down to a special event called Arrival Day. He didn't understand what that meant. He thought that to arrive somewhere, you had to travel there, like when he went from the children's dorm to school on the transit car. He didn't understand how they could be travelling when nothing around him moved. His teacher had said that arrival day would be when they reached their new home. He was looking up at the clock, watching the numbers change, when someone tapped him on his shoulder. He spun around just in time to see a little girl running away. She was from another class. He didn't know her name. As she was running, she looked over her shoulder and giggled. Then she stopped and grinned. You can't catch me. Yes, I can, he exclaimed and took off after her. 
The girl gave a squeal and sped away, darting behind some shrubs. He followed, but the girl had disappeared. He paused. Where had she gone? She had to be on the other side of the bushes. He ran quickly around, just in time to see the flick of her ponytail and the flash of her heels before she vanished. He ran after her as fast as he could, but the girl was too quick. They ran around and around the shrub, panting and giggling. He was getting dizzy. He wanted to catch the girl, but how? He had an idea. He quickly about-faced and ran back the other way. A moment later, he collided with the girl and they bounced off each other before falling down onto the grass. Immediately, the girl stuck her knuckles in her eyes and began to sob loudly. He got up, concerned, rubbing his forehead where he'd hit it. He hadn't meant to hurt the girl. He'd only been playing. Her crying attracted the attention of his teacher. She came over and frowned at him, standing and apparently unharmed, while the girl was sitting on the ground and sobbing. She looked accusingly at him. What's wrong? she asked the girl. Are you hurt? What happened, Ethan? Did you hurt her? He didn't reply. He had hurt the girl, but only by accident. He hadn't meant to. The girl took her hands from her face and said, Oh no, he didn't hurt me. We only bumped. She stood up and straightened her play suit. Wiping away her tears, she gave him a smile. OK, said the teacher. Well, be a little more careful, both of you. If you want to run around, look where you're going. The teacher went away and the girl invited him to play a game using little sticks. It was a neat game. He had a lot of fun and was sad when the teacher said it was time to leave. He waved goodbye as the girl's class walked away in a crocodile line of pairs. His new friend waved too. He hoped he would see her again. As he stood and watched the girl leave, the park turned strange and fuzzy. His teacher's voice, telling him to hurry up, became distant and indistinct. The sadness he'd been feeling at his friend's departure grew stronger and more painful. He had an ache in his chest that felt like someone had stabbed him. He looked down. The agony was so great he expected to see a knife handle protruding from his heart. He jerked awake, squinting in the sunlight now shining directly on his face. The flitter was unbearably hot. He opened his door and refreshing, cool air rushed in. The pain from his dream still gripped him. Lauren. He'd dreamt of the first time they'd met. His face was wet and he was breathing heavily. He slumped back in his seat. Lauren. Her death still hurt so much. Some days he would almost forget she was gone, but on others the memory would hit him like it was yesterday. He didn't think he would ever get over losing her, or the appalling sense of helplessness when he remembered he'd failed to save her life. He wiped his face on his shirt sleeve and checked the time. Almost an hour had passed. The shuttle would be arriving soon. He would have to try to brighten up a little for Cariad's sake, though after his dream he felt almost guilty for arranging to meet with her. It didn't feel right that he should go on living, meeting new people and doing new things, while poor Lauren's life had been cut abruptly short. He squinted up at the sky where the approaching shuttle should soon appear. There it was. He'd seen the telltale flash as the sun hit it. Within moments he saw it properly, the silver wedge swooping down. In five minutes it would land, and Cariad would be out soon after she had passed through the new arrival procedure. His sad mood began to lift. He would enjoy Cariad's company for a quiet afternoon out at his farm. As the shuttle approached, he raised his hand to shade his eyes. A flash burst from the speeding ship, so bright it blinded him. An ear-splitting boom followed. He blinked, desperately trying to bring back his vision while his ears rang from the noise. 
When he could finally see again, the sky was filled with smoking, flaming, spiralling parts plummeting to the ground. Dimly, he heard screams and shouts of disbelief. His hand was still shading his eyes, his mouth agape. Debris from the shuttle began to rain down. Twisted pieces of metal pierced the station office and the lot. Outside, moaning, screaming and sobbing continued. But he couldn't speak. He couldn't move. Cariad had been on the shuttle. The shuttle had exploded. Cariad was gone. Chapter 19 Cariad had only been speaking to Stromquist for a moment when an emergency announcement broke into the line. A shuttle had exploded. Her news about Frederick Apparicio died on her lips. The interface screen switched from Stromquist's image to a vid of the vessel exploding. It was a view from the planet's surface. Her legs were suddenly weak. She sat on her bunk. Are you seeing this? Yes, Stromquist replied. I'm sorry to say. In horror, she watched the shuttle debris falling like fiery rain. Numbly, she tried to process the news. No one could have survived the explosion. How many had died? Each shuttle carried two pilots and four cabin crew. How many passengers had been aboard? She gasped. Carriad? She had arranged to go planet side to see Ethan. She had planned to travel on that shuttle, but her realisation about Apparicio had wiped the arrangement from her mind. She should have been one of the passengers. Her stomach clenched. Ethan would have been waiting for her. He would have been at the shuttle field. He would think she was dead, and he might have been hurt by the falling debris. Had there been planet-side casualties too? I have to contact someone urgently. But you said you had something to tell me about Apparicio. If you have any more information on him, I must know immediately. I don't think this explosion is an accident. You don't? It's extremely unlikely that any vessel belonging to the Nova Fortuna project would spontaneously explode. The shuttles were built well for their era and very safe. We'll investigate, naturally. But my guess is, this is another natural movement sabotage. When is this going to stop? She paused to collect herself. What I have to tell you about Apparicio isn't much, but it might help. I'll calm you again in a couple of minutes. I'll be waiting. She closed the comm to the Guardian ship and tried to open one to the planet's surface. If she couldn't contact Ethan directly, she could at least leave a message at the farmer's dorms. But the comm line wouldn't open. Everyone aboard the Nova had to be attempting to comm the planet. Most shuttle passengers were woken, travelling to the surface to take samples or make observations. Their friends aboard ship would be trying to find out if, by some miracle, they had survived. Nevertheless, she tried to open a line again. She had to let Ethan know she was okay. Another ship-wide announcement broke in. Ship-to-surface comms have been temporarily suspended. Preliminary reports on the shuttle explosion state that 27 passengers and 6 crew were aboard. Guardians are at the scene surveying the wreckage. No survivors are expected. 33 deaths. The shuttle had been unusually full. Most of the time they only carried 10 or 15 passengers. 33 more people had died, most of them woken. Who were they? She dreaded finding out. Why had the natural movement targeted a shuttle? If the bomber had wanted to kill a lot of people, they only had to blow up one of the dorms where hundreds of gens slept. But they'd picked a shuttle and an exceptionally full one at that. The intention was clear. Kill as many woken as possible. On her interface screen was a frozen image of the explosion. The passenger manifest and the names of the pilot and crew began to scroll across it. Her eyes filled with tears. Many of the names were familiar. Women and men she'd worked alongside for years. 
Despite all the previous setbacks, for the first time since her revival, she felt hope slipping away. After the first night attack, and even after the stadium bombing, she had clung to the belief that the colony would win through. She had seen the saboteurs as serious but solvable problems. All the colonists had to do was to catch the perpetrators and move on. But then Anahi had started up her mad divisive schemes, including reviving the powder keg that was Aubrio. And now the natural movement had struck again, giving them all a brutal reminder of their lethal threat and the fact that even the Guardians, with their advanced tech, had failed to identify them. For several long moments, despair crushed down. She questioned why she had joined the project, why she'd left Earth and everyone she loved. She remembered her parents and her sister's last embraces. In those final moments, they had all clung together tightly. Guilt at her decision wrung every fibre of her being. How could she have put her family through that dreadful parting? Here she was, light years away and nearly two centuries later, and everything she had dreamed of was collapsing around her. She was a participant in humanity's first failed attempt at space colonisation. She had subjected the people she loved to deep pain and grief and deprived herself of their love and companionship for nothing. As she recalled the final look her mother had given before they parted forever, something shifted deep inside. Anguish and surrender were replaced by anger and determination. She wiped her eyes. She would not let the natural movement or Anahi win. She would fight for the colony with every gram of strength she had. She owed it to her family and she owed it to herself. She refused to accept they had all suffered for nothing. She would make the colony a success or die trying. Hope remained. She had her friendship with Ethan, for one thing. Woken and Jens could work together. They could get through this. Again, she tried to calm the settlement, but nothing was working. When would they lift the suspension? A security alert sounded, and the ship's comm announced, The leader has declared a state of emergency. Shuttle flights and private comms are prohibited indefinitely. Please await further instructions. No private comms? How could she contact Ethan and Stromquist? She got up. She had to find a Nahi and try to talk some sense into her. The self-appointed leader was at her official suite. The leader's residence included an office as well as living quarters. Traditionally, anyone could make an appointment to speak face to face with the leader. By the time Cariad arrived, the office was crowded with people, appointments notwithstanding. It seemed like almost all the remaining Woken were crushed inside, along with the Gens who worked aboard the ship. Anahi was in a corner, trying to speak to the crowd, but her voice was drowned out by the hubbub. People were discussing what had happened and shouting out questions. Cariad tried to push her way through to get closer, but the office was too tightly packed. As she was trying to figure out a way to speak to Anahi, the leader climbed onto a chair and waved her hands, asking for silence. Please, she said as the noise died down. I'm doing everything I can to keep control of this situation. We mustn't panic. That's exactly what the bomber wants. They want to undermine this colony. It was another bomb, a voice exclaimed. I knew it. That hasn't been confirmed yet. But for now, I'm treating the explosion as an act of terrorism. Do the natural movement really want to undermine the colony? Asked Awoken, a meteorologist. It seems to me the saboteurs have switched tactics. Now they're targeting Woken. They want us all dead, and they want the Gens in control. We don't know that. We don't know anything yet. It's early days. We mustn't speculate. The Guardians are already examining the wreckage to find out the cause. 
If the natural movement is responsible, the Guardians might find evidence that will lead us to the saboteur. When will we be able to comp planet side? The plump young Gen maintenance worker asked. I want to talk to my wife. She'll be worried about me. And when will I be able to go home? These are all questions I'm not able to answer right now. Cariad cupped her hands around her mouth. Anahi, she called over the heads of the crowd. I have information that might help the Guardians catch the bomber. I have to calm Stromquist. Anahi's black visual aid turned in her direction. She gave a huff of frustration. Very well, Cariad. Come with me into the back office. She climbed down from her chair and the crowd eased apart a little to allow Cariad through. When she reached Anahi, the older woman unlocked a door at the back of the room and motioned her inside. Anahi closed and locked the door with a sigh. My interface, over there, she pointed. It's the only one that comes outside the ship. Cariad wanted to speak to Anahi about her decision to ban private comms, but speaking to Stromquist was more urgent. She opened the interface. The Guardian answered immediately. It's good to hear from you. I've been trying to calm Anahi to tell her I needed to speak to you urgently, but she didn't reply. Cariad looked at Anahi, who said, Things have been a little busy around here, in case you hadn't noticed. Cariad returned her attention to Stromquist. I remembered where I met Frederick Apparicio. I know who he was. Excellent. Cariad took a breath. He was one of the first generation applicants. Now that she'd finally recalled the man, small details of her encounter with him kept popping into her head. His application was rejected. Subnormal sperm count. What's this about? Anahi interrupted. Who was this man? Cariad briefly explained how she'd been helping Stromquist with his investigations. Are you certain you remember who this man was? There were tens of thousands of applicants. I remember him because he appealed. He took it all the way to the Supreme Court. Don't you remember? There were about 20 rejected applicants who argued for their right to join the project. Their attorneys cited discrimination laws, human rights precedents. They really scraped the barrel. I do remember. I felt sorry for them. Me too, until I met Frederick Apparicio. Cariad turned to the interface and Stromquist. After they'd run out of appeals and the final judgment was given, Apparicio contacted me. He wanted to speak to me in person. I was insanely busy. We all were, but I agreed. Like a Nahi, I pitied him. The litigants had spent millions fighting to join the project and lost it all. They had to pay our defence costs too. I should have wondered then where a systems engineer got all that money, but I was overwhelmed with work. Wait, Stromquist said. I have to echo Anahi. Are you sure you're thinking of the right person? We have records of the court case. If Frederick Apparicio was involved, his name would have come up in our searches. I'm sure. I also don't know why his name isn't in your records, but I remember him coming into my office as clearly as if it were yesterday. He was pissed as anything. In fact, he was so angry, I was a little scared and considered calling security. I got him to sit down and I tried to explain the importance of optimum fertility in the candidates, which turned out to be a very bad move. He took it as an insult to his masculinity, so I tried a different tactic. I told him about the strict limitation on the numbers of the first generation, and that all the supplies and life support systems had been calculated based on that number, so we couldn't add even one extra person. I emphasised that if we added him, it would mean someone else would lose their place. Nothing I said convinced him or even calmed him down. Finally, he accepted that a face-to-face -face meeting with one of the project organisers wasn't going to help him. He stormed out. That was the last I saw of him. When I think about the encounter now, I'm surprised it took me so long to remember him. 
It was only when I was talking to a colleague about the decisions around what game meets to bring along that I finally slotted him into place. Strongquist said, I'm sorry, but I have to ask you again. Are you absolutely certain the person you remember was Frederick Aparicio? The human mind can play tricks, inserting memories where there are none, and seeing patterns that don't exist. Could it be that you're mixing up your visitor with someone else? What can I say? I'm as sure as I can be. Do you have my work records from that time? I would have made a note about the meeting. I'll look into it. All we've found on our suspect so far are his affiliation with the natural movement, public data on him, and the recordings you saw. We haven't traced a single connection with the Nova Fortuna project. If he was an applicant, that would have been immediately apparent. That he was one of twenty litigants in the... He paused. I have an idea. I need to do some further research. I'll contact you again if I need to ask you anything else. And now he said, Strongquist, before you go, I want to speak to you about the current situation. This latest catastrophe has put everything on a new footing. People are panicking. That isn't surprising. What do you want to say? We'll do everything we can to catch the perpetrator of this crime, if that's what it is. I understand that, and I appreciate the Guardian's efforts, but I wanted to know if you can help with the situation here. Cariad stared at Anahi. What situation? Ignoring her, Anahi continued to Strongquist. I'm concerned that things might get out of hand aboard ship. We don't have any security here, and with feelings running so high, I'm worried someone might get hurt. You want guardians aboard the Nova? You want your bully squad to control Woken too? Is that what things have come to? Strongquist was looking uncomfortable. Do you believe your life or other lives are under threat? Cariad replied. No one's life is under threat. Anahi, we do not need or want guardians patrolling the Nova Fortuna. We're in a state of emergency, Anahi replied. I just think everyone would feel more comfortable. You would feel more comfortable, you mean? Two guards with weapons standing outside your office and protecting you when you fail to do your job would help you relax a little, right? Have you entirely lost your mind? Cariad found she was shouting. She breathed deeply, in and out, and went on in a quieter tone. Half of those people in your office are your personal friends. You want to threaten them with guns? Before Anahi could answer, Strongquist asked, How many are aboard your ship right now? About seventy woken, Anahi replied, and roughly fifty gens helping to run the place. Some woken were working planet side when the shuttle exploded. Our resources are stretched at the moment. We'll have our hands full controlling the situation at the settlement, and we're doing all we can to catch this saboteur. He or she has to be aboard the ship, right? Cariad interjected. To have planted the bomb on the shuttle? Not necessarily. The shuttles aren't searched, more's the pity. A bomb could have been planted on one at any time. The bomber might have secreted it on one trip and then activated it from the surface when the shuttle returned. They would only need to wait until the vessel came within range of their signal. Still, it's a possibility the saboteur is among us, said Anahi. I don't think it's any more likely than the person living in the settlement. Actually, after hearing Cariad's new information and all other things considered, I think it's very likely the person is a gen. I'm not surprised, Cariad said. Most of the surviving Woken are here and we won't be taking shuttles to the surface any time soon. That means the gens can operate with less oversight and interference. The shuttle explosion could have been planned with that intention. With that in mind, I believe the best deployment of our resources will be planet side. The Woken who are currently there are at risk. We have to protect them and return them to the Nova Fortuna as soon as possible. 
Karyad said to Anahi. Looks like you're just going to have to deal with all these people up here asking difficult questions yourself. Despite the fact that her blind eyes were hidden behind her visor, she felt Anahi's glare. Unless the situation aboard your ship escalates, I would strongly suggest that we devote Guardian resources to more threatening and urgent situations. Anahi hesitated before saying, I understand. Strongquist signed off. When will you be restoring comms to the surface? Cariad asked. I need to speak to Ethan urgently. I was supposed to be aboard that shuttle. He must be thinking I was killed. You nearly took that shuttle? You were lucky. I think ship to planet Com can return in a couple of hours. I'm waiting on confirmation of the deaths so I can put out an official notice and for things to calm down. Two hours would have to do. When Ethan saw her name wasn't on the notice of the deaths, he would know she was okay. Her comm button chirped. It was Alastair. There was only one reason the medic would contact her. Orbio must have regained consciousness, but she didn't want Anahi to know. She wanted to be the first woken to speak to him. I have to go, she told Anahi. Good luck with your little gathering. As she was about to leave, however, Anahi's interface signalled an incoming comm. It was Strongquist again. When Anahi opened the screen, the Guardian's face was grave. Have you received a message from the surface? Anahi replied that they hadn't. The Gens must have decided to allow the information to filter through. We just heard from one of the team's planet side that the Gens are refusing our instructions to remain inside while we collect the debris from the crash. They're stating that any attempts to control their movements will be resisted with extreme force. The End This has been The Concordia Deception, Space Colony 1, Book 1 written and narrated by J.J. Green. The next book in the Space Colony 1 series is The Feeler Epiphany, Space Colony 1, Book 2. For more J.J. Green books, visit jjgreenauthor.com.